Welcome to Wisdom from Life, where we sift through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. Today, we're talking about the paradox of choice. So what, what is the paradox of choice? It's the inability to, uh, or the, the idea that if we have more choice, that's good. But then all of a sudden, when you are presented with a thousand options, then you can't actually choose any single one. Yeah, we, we all experience this at some time, I think, in our day-to-day -day life. A common example of this is when you ask a group of people, where do you want to go for dinner? And, you know, if, if you've only got one place to go, the local pizza restaurant, well, that's where you're going, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you've got 20 different possibilities and you start putting these out there to people, you know, this person wants Thai and this person says, well, that's that's good. But I really wanted Chinese instead. And then this person says, no, no, we got to go to that new burger restaurant. And pretty soon you've got all these different choices out there and it turns into quite an ordeal. It, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> You know? Yeah, it's one of those like lovely things about if you want to live in a small town, it's like, well, you got two or three places to go. Yeah, the danger of that, and, and you're right, this is something where it is paradoxical. The danger of that is that you get bored with the the too short range of an options that you have. So you're like, ah, I got I got to go to this place again. Or you know, when when I was a kid, we actually only had four channels that we could get on the TV because it was before cable came in and we lived way out in the sticks, so we couldn't get channel 18 or channel 24, uh, which were like a revelation when I, when I was a kid because then we could watch cartoons during the daytime rather than only on on Saturdays. But you, you know, you had the 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 shows that you had and that was it. And if you missed the show, you know, you better hope for a rerun down the line sometime. And, you know, so we, we'd complain about that. And then you think, well, it's going to be great if we get more and more choices. And th there was that phenomenon of, they, I think they called it 5,000 channels or 500 channels and nothing on when, it, when yeah. cable first came in because you had all this, this stuff. And, you know, we can experience this in, in so many different ways. So what's what's your like bottom line take on on it is it, is it really a big problem for us um it can be um if you let it i guess is okay what my big takeaway is so and that if you're yeah that's, if you're trying to get to something perfect and you have a thousand choices and it becomes very very difficult to actually quantify what the, the perfect choice is yeah or even to just go by anything that's qualitative to determine where the different levels would would be you can mess around with it forever and you consume a lot of time and a lot of let's call it brain space you know mm -hmm. so that by the end you might make a decision just out of exhaustion and like i don't really want to like offend anyone but like we, we've got a, a thousand and one different types of coffee out there mm, and yeah yeah <laughs> yeah at one point i was like well it's folgers and folgers dark roast and that's about it. You know, you might get a couple other brands that are like that was that was it. And now you've got like you know, a thousand and one different types of coffee roasts, which are great. You know, you can really become like this uh, connoisseur of coffee. But if it's if it's not like your hobby, then uh, it actually presents a problem because it's like, well, I don't even know if I'm gonna like this. Like some people don't like hazelnut. And you're like, well, it's coffee. You grab it, and all of a sudden, it's not what you were expecting. Yeah, and I, I remember the enjoyment when I like first encountered um, coffees like that that are flavored with things other than coffee. Uh, Irish cream was a, a particular favorite of mine when I was in college, and it was sort of a, a revelation. Oh, you can have this this way, right? And you feel this sense of freedom. But then after a while, it's 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 not really freeing you up. It's it's actually the the feeling is almost like not oppressive, but, you know, you, you feel like you, you, you have to figure out what the right thing to do is in these cases. And this is like totally trivial stuff. What, what you're going to put in your cup, that's not a big deal. But mm -hmm. people, people run into this with all sorts of other things. What car to buy, what clothes to wear, where to go to college. Um, who what to, to study. Yeah. Who to date. Um, oh, who to marry. Exactly. Yeah. So the paradox of, of choice. Well, we should talk about this book, right? Because it, it became a tagline, I think, because of Barry Schwartz's book. And it's been quite a while since it came out. It's over 15 years. 
So he he was saying, and he was focusing primarily on on market stuff, on on we, we call re- retail um, mm-hmm. stuff, and he said that. Uh, you know, we, we tend to think of choice as a good thing. We want to try to maximize it as much as possible. And then, you know, we've got all these different options and we want to pick the best option for ourselves. But that's actually the wrong way to go about things, that that makes us less happier paradoxically than when somebody just puts two or three options in, in front of us. So there's this go-to quote that, that people always bring up something that he said, autonomy and freedom of choice are critical to our well-being and choice is critical to freedom and autonomy. Nonetheless, though modern Americans have more choice than any group of people has ever had before, and thus presumably more freedom and autonomy, we don't seem to be benefiting from it psychologically. Now, what do you think? Is is that true that we're, we're not happier than, say, people in the 1950s or, you know, let's, let's take something really determinate. You know, you go to a fast food restaurant. Uh, it used to be that you basically had the one thing that they made, like McDonald's made hamburgers. And that was you know, hamburgers, fries, milkshakes. You know, you could get your hamburger with onions on it or not, but that was basically it. And then they started coming out with all sorts of other things eventually, you know, the filet fish and, and uh, uh, you know, the McRib and, and started experimenting with all sorts of other things. And then after a while, there's, there's, it's like any other place. It's almost like a, going into a diner. You've got this massive menu of potential choices. Although you do see that there's a, a contracting. You know, like it goes through the, uh, I don't know if it came, has gone through cycles yet, but definitely like expanded. All of a sudden there's like, you know, a hundred different things in the menu. And then like they're pairing it down. It's like, well, we don't yeah. actually need that like particular Angus burger, that like double Angus burger. It's like, yeah. yeah. That's, that, that's true. And, and, you know, I suppose there's sort of a cycle that restaurants go through with these things. And a lot of it's probably on based on what sells or, right. or, or what gets them into trouble. Mm-hmm. But also, like when you're you're producing these things, it, it uh, costs you a lot to have all the ingredients on hand in order to make sure that you have all these different choices. Especially for a restaurant, it becomes that's you know, true. Another yeah. there, there's a, a cost for having the increased choices, and you know you. But to go back to your answer, like okay, were we happier back then versus now, and. I think it's kind of like a little bit of a an attention thing, okay? If you if you're uh, spending more time on deciding exactly what burger or what coffee or what you know of the of the things that are kind of trivial and not actually super important to one's life, does that actually uh, steal kind of vampirically from or parasitically from those things that are actually important? Yeah, so you end up getting less time to enjoy your stuff or perhaps you have less attention to devote to it after you've, you've made your decisions. Right. Right. Yeah. What about, I mean, what are some things that are less trivial where the paradox of choice can be problematic for us? Well, I guess, you know, those things that actually are going to take up a lot of our time and kind of like have a, a large impact on the, trajectory of our lives you know, we only have one life to live right that's right as yeah. far as we know um and uh so you know as we talked about earlier those those things that got more and more important the the people that you date uh, the the school that you decide to go to the jobs that we take um and this kind of no oh, please i think with jobs you could say the jobs we consider right because you often won't just apply to one job. You'll, I mean, you could be at one place and then you're like, oh, this other opportunity looks really great. I'm going to move from this one to this one. But generally, when people are looking for jobs, they're applying to as many places as they can. I, I think, for example, about my, my poor students. This is a terrible uh, economy right now to be trying to get jobs in or even internships, you know. Um, right. It's not really feasible to do too much internship wise, I suppose, unless you can work remotely. And they will apply to, you know, a hundred different places. Mm-hmm. 
and then you might get offers. And how do you how do you you know weigh which one you should you should have? In a way, if you only have one offer, or two offers, that makes it a nice, simple, easy decision yeah. for you. You take the one that you've got. But if you have ten different places saying, "Yeah, we'd we'd like you to come in," and you really don't know much about any of them. You can do a little bit of research, but you, this is something we're going to talk about a little bit later on. There, there are some things where it's almost like a black box. You can't know enough about it to make a, a really well-informed decision. And some people will sit there and kind of obsess about it. They'll, they'll try to prognosticate and read into little things that they find here and there and try to, make, try to find some way to make that decision. Um, other people will just, you know, flip a coin or I, I suppose you could roll a 10-sided die if you have 10 different opportunities or something <laughs> like that, right? Or they'll right. go through some very complicated process of rank ordering of what they think is better and what they think is worse. And uh, some might just wait to see who calls them first. Sure. Yeah, that's one way. Like, that's a heuristic that, you know, it'll give you a decision. It might not be the best decision, but if you're happy enough, I'm like, hey, all ten of these I'd be happy with, like whatever. Yeah. So there's, there's, you know, um, Barry Schwartz was interested primarily just in one one field, but we're saying that this paradox of choice is something that runs a lot wider. Mm-hmm. It tr- it transfers across a number of different domains, and it's been around for a long time. It's it's, you know, when we look at ancient literature we can see that as cultures became able to afford a lot of choices to people, you know, think about dining, for example, um, the Romans, and we're talking about the people who actually had, you know, enough resources. So we're not talking about the, the average labor or something like that. But once people had sufficient money, they could actually get bored with all the different options for eating stuff that they had out there. And the Romans were ingenious in finding new sauces to make and new ways to stuff fish inside fish or things along those lines, <laughs> cook things in different ways, you know. Um, what, what, so it was, is that the start of a pesca pesca t- well, no, because they were not pescatarian. Yeah, or, well, I was I was referring to the fish inside of fish because I only eat fish that eat other oh, fish. Oh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I suppose. Uh, I was thinking you were talking about like the you know people who supplement only. vegetarianism with 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 fish. Yeah, um, I mean the the Romans ate pretty much anything they could they could get their hands on that was edible and even some things that weren't <laughs> total <laughs> trivia here. But, you know, we, we, we talk about like the lead pipes and how that wasn't good for them. But one of the ways of adulterating pepper was with lead shot too. And then they oh. would grind that up and, you know, that can't have been good for you either. Um, right. So and, mentioned all of their, the drink, a lot of the drinking cups were also lead. Yeah. The, the alcohol will leach it just a little bit. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. com- coming back to this, they they had a lot of different choices. And, and um, we could also talk about another issue is like with books. Um, people would acquire these vast libraries and then they wouldn't be able to pick out which book they should read. Mm. You know, and so they just sit there in front of all these. It was scrolls at the time, mm-hmm. but they'd sit in front of this, this wall. <laughs> and and I know what that's like myself because I've got a very large library. And some days I'll be like, well, should I should I read this or reread this? Or, you know, maybe I want to just, you know, relax and read some sci fi. But well, which author should I read then? It's it's a similar problem that can can happen in, in all different ways. Right. And so. Uh, one of the things I wanted to bring in was from the, the world of economics is opportunity cost. And so not only can you just like, okay, at this moment in time, what is the thing that I want to do or I want to choose at this moment? But also, everything that you choose means that you can't do the other thing. And so there's a cost associated with every single thing that you choose, both in your time and the resources, like your money, to like buy these things that you do. You buy a TV, you might not be able to buy that like leather jacket that you also wanted, you know, depending on what what your resource allotments are, and and so that's a, another thing that like adds on to this like feeling of unease is like kind of you'll we'll see you know as we talk about uh, procrastination later, it's like we have several things that we should or have to do, but you can't choose which one to do because there's a cost that might like cause the other one to 
not have enough time to do it. And then you result in not doing anything. Yeah. I'll, I'll bring in something from teaching actually. So one of the constant challenges in teaching college classes for those of us who, you know, try to make our classes pretty interesting and, and are kind of broad readers is the fact that you get, you get 15 weeks at best and probably you're not even going to get 15 weeks. Some of the places that I teach be the way that they set up their semester, you basically get 12 weeks. And if you're doing like an intro to philosophy class or an ethics class or, you know, it must be even worse with like literature classes for English uh, people or, or a history class, you know, so many different sources. You can only teach, you know, this much. And what you'd like to bring into the class is way wider. So you're constantly, if you bring somebody new in, you have to throw somebody else out. And you've never had enough people in. It's sort of like, you know, getting to decide to have a party in um, an apartment that only seats 12 people. <laughs> somebody else, you want to invite one of your new friends? Well, somebody else has got to get out of there. And if you want to spend two weeks on, on a particular text, well, that means you, that you've got to find that week, uh, and take it away from, from somebody else. So if Descartes is going to get two weeks this semester, that means maybe Hume goes, goes away or Mary Wollstonecraft or whoever, whoever it's going to be, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you feel, so you feel Descartes bad before Hume. Well, for me, um, I, well, I, I, I was that way. making a bad pun. Descartes before Hume. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, put Descartes before Hume. Oh, I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hume and horse aren't close enough. I think uh. <laughs> to, 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 <laughs> to pull that one off. You'd need somebody who sounds kind of horsey, you know? <laughs> um, but you know, we have, we have, I guess you could say similar things about who, like who you invite to a party, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we were, we're constantly faced with these sorts of things and you feel bad. It does make you feel bad. Right. So what else do we need to say about the, the paradox itself? Why, you know, why, why is it a paradox? Well, good things make us feel bad in some way. I guess that's the paradox, right? Yeah. And I think it really only like came to the forefront in the way that Barry Schwartz was talking about it because, um, with the advent of uh, you know lots of different choices in consumer and, and like yeah. capitalism under in the United States, um, that it became a thing that you could easily study because you now had these like vastly different ways that you could buy things, and it became a lot more quantifiable. Yeah, already in the 1950s and 60s, they were using this term marginal differentiation to talk about how products would be set apart from each other in very trivial ways. It could be as, as simple as like the box is red instead of blue, you know, but usually there'd be like some tweak, you know, like yeah. um, this, this uh, lamp is one inch taller and, you know, slightly different color or something like that. But then that produces a situation in which you do have to choose between all these, these different lines of, of products. And then, and, oh, go ahead. And, and that is uh, expanded into our modern age with um, A-B testing, especially if you're no longer working with atoms and making actual physical products. If you're only working with pixels, um, the, you know, oh, right. the marginal cost to create you know, a whole bunch of different options for people becomes near zero. And so now uh, one of the big things about you know, creating websites or social media or whatnot is presenting uh, to a large group of people, uh, slightly different uh, ways to present the same data, and through the aggregate of people's choices, figure out what the preferences are, and uh, and then craft things for those particular people. Yeah. So having more powerful tools makes us more susceptible to this, right? Right. I just thought of something else that's kind of along these lines. And, and I, I, I don't actually succumb to it myself because I'm kind of a busy guy and also a little bit lazy. But I know that there's some podcasters who take a very long time getting uh, podcast episodes done. And when you talk to them, the reason is because you can constantly tweak it. You can try out this filter or use this effect, or maybe you should like boost this thing this, this way. And it, I mean, it could take you all day long to edit five minutes if you really, really want to focus on it in that way. So you're saying because we do a radio show here, at least as our 
initial medium that is actually saving us from the illusion of choice because you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's only so much we can do. Well, I, I admit it. I'm, I'm a little bit lazy when it comes to it. I get to the point where I'm like, ah, that's good enough. you know. <laughs> uh, but, but if I was more conscientious, maybe I would spend an additional hour or 10 hours or something like that. And it's not going to make it that much better. You know, right. and there there goes that ten hours that I could have spent on something else. You know that that, that cost or that marginal increase in utility, or however you want to define that. Yeah, yeah. It, so it decreases. You know, like oh, oh, first first ten minutes you spend editing, you it might get half of what you are is going to make it good, and then you know the next hour only gives you another ten percent. Yeah, true. So this this is a philosophy focused show, and we have really I mean, other than saying like who we would have in a philosophy syllabus, we haven't really talked much philosophy here. <laughs> Why does the paradox of choice matter for practical philosophy? Um, because it is uh, about those determining of what is actually good on um, in, in the things that we actually choose. Uh, uh, about specifically decision making and planning um, can also um, can generate uh, like this thing that we're talking about. This you know paradox of choice is creating dissatisfaction, anxiety, and other effects within us. And one of the you know time tested questions within philosophy is what denotes a good life. And if there are things that are you know, specifically reducing our good life, then we should probably investigate them and try to find the, the core of these issues in order to try to avoid them. So with this, we can say that it's not choice itself that's a bad thing, right? Choice, choice generally we think is quite mm. good, and we value getting to make choices. So it's something about the way the choices are set up or structured that produces the the negative effects that lead us away from contentment or happiness or whatever it is that we want as our practical mm -hmm. end. So, so let's, let's pause on that for a minute. Why, why does having more choices uh, create this, this problem for us? Um, do we need to have like a certain kind of threshold where we say, okay, that's, that's enough choices? Or, or is, it, is it more of a dispositional thing, like people don't know how to handle choices well, and maybe you know, some deeper philosophical um, analysis of this would help us to handle choices better? And what do you think? I, I think both are ripe for investigation okay. to try to figure out if there is some delineation between what is, I guess, bad and what is good enough. Um, or, or like taking that to the extent, like, are, is there something that you should then prioritize all over uh, all other things? Um, as, as well as, uh, this, this other, like the choosing. So you brought up an interesting thing that Schwartz talks about in his book, and you, you've brought this up as well in different episodes, like the, the idea of being a satisficer as mm -hmm. opposed to a maximizer. And we should say what that means, right? So, yeah. Maximizer, uh, you're trying to make the the best decision possible. Uh, get get you know if if there's some way of figuring out what the maximum payoff is going to be in terms of pleasure or usefulness or whatever, you you have to go for that, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And the, the satisficer is someone that has uh, a level in which the decision is satisfactory enough in order to say like, oh, that's good, and the, and. It, it, this is like a trade-off because one, you're you're prioritizing like whatever you define as um, the the maximizing thing, and the other one is saying, um, you know, maybe maybe the thing that I'm really trying to maximize here is time, and thus I need to uh, have a, a level where like, oh, right, well, that I made that decision. Unless you feel like that is the whole idea of time as maximization, it creates a satisficer. Yeah. It's, uh, off base. You know, it's interesting that you're bringing up like different variables or we could call mm -hmm. them whatever we want to call them, different factors, different priorities. Right. And so a maximizer could be understood in, in two different ways. One would be where like they identify the one area that they want to maximize. And that's that's it. That's going to drive what's going on. Like they're going to make the most money or they're going to somehow 
uh, have the drink or meal that's going to provide the most pleasure in some way or who, who knows what there, but there, there's a most in some category. And then you could have, let's call them like a super maximizer, you know, because the satisficer could say to them, Hey, um, there's more to life than just what you're focusing on. I kind of want to have it distributed over a bunch of different things. Like, you know, one of the thing, one of the priorities for me is not wasting a ton of time on trivial, you know, increases that you're you're requiring me to do here and i just want to like you know so think about like i'll give you an example um i had a family member one time who got on my case when when peeling shrimp uh for for christmas because i wasn't preserving that tiny little bit of tail meat there and i was like come on i know how to i know how to peel shrimp i've been doing this since i was a kid you just peel it and throw it in there and move on to the next shrimp you know because i want to eat some shrimp <laughs> that's that's my goal <laughs> is to have some shrimp and cocktail sauce and you know sit there with with a, a beer and i don't want to spend all this time on like wiggling this tiny little thing out and this person had gotten this from some some class or something like that mm -hmm. and now in their eyes i'm being kind of a, a philistine or a slob or whatever right i'm not maximizing shrimp meat you know and apparently that that little bit of meat is supposed to be sweeter or something like that you know so let's call it like culinary units i'm not providing the maximum culinary units to this to this operation that we're engaged in and i'm saying you know i kind of want to like eat this shrimp before it gets too late tonight you know? so there's two variables there and i and we could also talk about like you know not wanting it to be a big deal that's another variable so now the maximizer could come back and say okay, cool. We've got all these different variables. Let's maximize all of them. Yeah. <laughs> Which would be totally quixotic, you know. Uh, but I imagine there's probably some people like that who think that you can actually maximize everything. And it's, it's actually uh, rather prevalent in the software development world that... Oh, really? Uh, oh, yeah. Like, well, software is all about maximization, especially, okay, you, you have, like, Certain things like either you're you're gonna maximize for speed or you're gonna mass maximize for efficiency, and there are different uh, algorithms to do these things. And once you've chosen the thing that you want to maximize for, you make it your mission to like strip out anything that is going to like slow down that operation. And 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 then this this idea then extends on into people's like actual lives and how they live, and becomes like this maximization. I, I know. Um, several people that uh, really got in the Soylent train, which is oh. a, a meal replacement that's like a chalky which is not milk people. Thing. <laughs> it is it's not people. Yeah. We, we swear. Uh, um, and because like, oh, well, I don't have to cook. I don't have oh, to like go out right, anywhere. Right, it's just, yeah, yeah. it's there. I've got like 30 bottles of the stuff. I just grab one. I drink three a day and I'm good. That's like, it, it's sacrificing all enjoyment that one would get from actually eating yeah and so it's like okay nutrition is the only important thing and i'm going to sacrifice everything else because i'm just here to code wow yeah that that is for me that would be a massive sacrifice you know but so so, so would you say that there's there's like a mindset that or maybe there's some some fields in which there are mindsets that make us more susceptible to thinking that optimization is what we need to do, you know, or maximization. Oh, absolutely. And like, as I said, like, especially uh, engineering and software, like that's, that's your entire job is, is finding better ways of doing things faster, cheaper, or like less resource intensive ways of doing things and then making them automatic. Okay. I wonder what other fields would be, this may be something we talk about later on, but maybe there's there's other fields that are particularly susceptible to that. Where where per perfectionism is a mm -hmm. a uh, key component, you know. And, and I I've fallen into it a little bit. Like I I cook once a week. Okay. And I put everything in in Tupperware dishes because, um, like I don't want to spend all that much time on, on cooking, but I do like tasty food, and I found a couple recipes that I really enjoy, and I've been eating literally for years now, like. You know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I eat the same thing most days of the week. Um, but they're all very tasty. And so I yeah, I, 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 I think I found a little bit of a middle ground. 
Yeah, you know, and, and something else I think that people do this with is clothing, right? Mm-hmm. You can get really into fashion, which which has never been something attracting me, uh, in part because I always saw it as kind of a waste of money and a, a waste of time since things go out of fashion so quickly. But you, you could get into that and, and, like, you know, obsess about having this thing and it has to match with this thing over here. And uh, it could be quite difficult to make, make choices about what to wear. Um, then you could be at the other extreme and be Steve Jobs, who deliberately, you know, he said that he deliberately wore the outfit that he had so he wouldn't have to think at all about what he was going to to wear sort of like olive oil the cartoon character there's a scene where she opens up her her closet and it's all the same dress <laughs> that, that's almost become a trope with especially cartoons i feel like i've seen that scene that same scene several times that it's it's, it's probably the case but it probably does come from popeye i'm imagining because it's such an old cartoon mm-hmm. you know and, and it's nice too because you're like well i guess she at least changes her clothes so you know if you think about cartoon it's a total digression but if you think about cartoon characters they're always wearing the same thing right could right. be that they never actually change their clothes which per, from a personal hygiene perspective that's not a, not a good thing it's not great no. <laughs> good good thing we don't have smell a vision on the, the <laughs> cartoons maybe they'd stink really terribly continue on with like this choice and like you know one uh in, in philosophy uh depending on the different like, schools if you have like a, a school like the epicureans which are uh, based in hedon- hedonistic ideas of like pleasure and pain defining what is good or bad um this is a, a way or a tool or a heuristic to try to solve some of these things. Um, and then also like trying to choose between the different things that we, we might think are valuable, um, depending on if they are or not, um, you know, our time, our relationships, our tastes, our enjoyment, our money, um, experiences. These are all things that you could potentially, if you wanted to try to maximize or at least like give a couple of them priority over, over others. Yeah. So that actually leads us into some of the other dark sides of the paradox of choice, because you can try to maximize, right? But you're, you're going to fail and you may disappoint yourself in the process because you, you, you really want to put, you know, this amount of work and time and in, into uh, maximizing, but you don't do it. And then you feel, you feel bad about yourself. You feel like you made the wrong choice mm-hmm. or you made a choice that wasn't reasonable for you to make at the time. And there, there's a number of, well, let's, let's talk about some of these dynamics. One of them is this old phrase, the grass is greener on the other side. And, you know, when we have real things that we've chosen, there's sometimes a tendency to look at the imperfections, look at the uh, ways in which it's not optimal and to, you know, see something else, you know, so if we want to use this metaphor, you look at your grass, it's easy to see where there's dandelions and, you know, brown patches or your, your mower cut too, too low. And you look at your neighbor's grass, which is a little bit further away, you can't see the imperfections quite so well. And you're like, oh, it's probably better over there, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and we say this about jobs. We say this about relationships. We say this about all sorts of things, you know. Um, so a, a person can think, oh, I made the wrong choice. I should have chosen this and I chose this other thing instead. And now I'm stuck with this choice. And then they, they feel bad about the good thing that they actually have, you know, which is not a perfect thing, but at least is good in many respects. You can, and this could happen in a restaurant. I mean, you could be sitting there, you've got your meal in front of you and you, you, you look across and you're like, oh, I should have ordered what that person ordered. Right. Right. And, you know, once you made your decision, you should probably sit with the decision, at least for a bit. You know, like, there should probably be, like, uh, when I talk about, like, local maxima and minima, um, but if you've got, like, a, a graph of, like, uh, enjoyment, and you're going to get to, um, you're going to get to, like, some uh, homeostasis, which would be, like, a local minima, that there's probably, there, there's a cost to go to any uh, other you know, local minima. No, uh, You're going to have to explain that for our, our <laughs> listeners, I think, right? Okay, so um, so we, we make an, made a choice, and, and now there's a cost associated with changing any of these choices. And so mm-hmm. once you made a choice, um, 
there there should be a really good reason to actually like make a, a big choice to change like so we're at the restaurant I've just spent, you know, $20 on a meal. All of a sudden, like, well, that thing looks really great over there. Are you going to just, like, throw out $20 worth of food and say, like, no, give me that, as well as the time <laughs> it takes to prepare that. It's like, yeah. Um, and, and, like, it, I don't think there's a problem in making different decisions, but you you should probably figure out what is the cost that one wants to incur in order actually to make that uh, decision. You know, another factor that fits in with that as well is if you chose a meal, right, the meal is not going to get upset that you didn't eat it because um, mm-hmm. it doesn't have any consciousness. But if you chose um, to be involved in a relationship with this person mm-hmm. and then you're like, oh, I think I should have gone with that person instead. If you do that, then you you are probably going to hurt some feelings unless they're happy to see you gone, you know. Uh, if they realize that you were a bad choice yourself or something <laughs> like that. Um, but, you know, and we can say this about work relationships too. You know, if you, you started a company and you're like, oh, I don't really like it here that much. I, I think I'll go to that other place instead. You're going to create some ill will, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, except for a little tangent. Um, apparently uh, Zappos, um, who uh, his, the founder of which, um, had this policy of like coming to an employee like a month after they started and said like here's a thousand dollars if you quit wow and so uh, it, it basically said i'm giving you an out it's totally fine if you don't like the job here's some money it'll, it'll hold you off for a couple months until you get a new job um no no hard feelings no ill will because the only one of the people that were actually really really wanted to work there and so like it, it makes sense that like you're you're not stuck with this bad decision um, yeah. as well and it, it's beneficial really to both parties the employer and the employee that's that's really interesting are there did he have like stats on like how many employees took the thousand dollars and left did he ever say that or not that i saw but apparently since amazon bought them um, amazon has, has taken this idea at least to some oh. parts of his company Interesting. Ooh. It's almost like um, they're offering you a severance package, right? Yeah, but it's it's really early on. Yeah. So, wow, that's it's an interesting thought. It it sure is. Yeah. So so philosophy can help us in in figuring these these matters out, and we're not going to like commit ourselves to any particular school of philosophy. But there's sort of a meta problem here in that you probably do need to pick one. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be an Epicurean, or you could be a Stoic, or you could you know follow something else. You don't want to have to like pick and choose between all the different available philosophical positions you know what which one is going to be the basis for making these decisions because that would just kick the problem up to a higher level um you, you're probably better off picking something and experimenting with it right right um and so like one of the things is that we often use heuristics to make decisions and and these are uh also known as like cognitive biases and that you know these heuristics are really good because you know, a lot of them actually result in good outcomes a lot of the time. Like, they're, they're good enough for us and our ancestors to have, uh, like, gone through our lives and, and, and got enough food and shelter and procreated to, to now have the current crop of humans floating around that we are. Um, but they also can result in us having really bad outcomes. But, like, it's, it's kind of a rule of thumb. It works, like, 90% of the time, and that's good enough for most of the people. Yeah. Um, and and so we can we can use heuristics and and some of the ideas from these particular schools of thought are also heuristics. Um, is like you know if you're Epicurean, if it's pleasurable, that's the way that's that's your heuristic. You know, you go towards the pleasure, you go away from the pain. It's it's pretty you know straightforward in that way. But it is is useful to reassess these heuristics once you've chosen them. And so you know, say you say you want to try out being. Um, you know, a Platonist or an Aristotelian or a, uh, a Stoic or a Epicurean. Um, try, try, like, out trying to make these decisions based on these uh, particular schools of thought, 
you know, and see how you like it. Yeah, you know, with with modern stoicism, there is, and we've gone through it already this year, um, Stoic Week, which used to be called Live Like a Stoic Week. And the idea behind it was they would they would give you like a handbook that each day had a couple, you know, reading selections and some exercises and, and it would have you engaging in some some reflection about your life and your decision making. And and you would try it out, just like you're saying, you would um, apply it and then see whether it made any changes in your overall mood or whether you'd made better decisions and prioritizations or whether you'd had any, you know, insights or things like that. And we could imagine doing this. Maybe there should be like, you know, starter packs for <laughs> for all these different philosophies, you know, if you want to give this a shot and see how it how it helps you um, zero in on what's important for you. Because, you know, one of the things that you're you're saying here is that if you do pick a particular approach to things, it at least narrows this range of choices down. Some choices are just going to be totally uh, irrelevant at that point, right? Um, you're not going to, you're not going to consider them. You're not going to worry about them afterwards. Um, you're not going to, for example, you know, so one of the other things I wanted to talk about is a a recent phenomenon called FOMO or fear of missing out that a lot of people have, which seems to have gotten a lot worse because of social media, you know, people see their friends on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or whatever else it's going to be. Um, doing things and they're like, oh man, I could be enjoying that right now. And, and put aside the fact that a lot of the stuff is just fabricated, you know, yeah. it's done with all these filters and, you know, idea, you know, 70 photos before you get the perfect selfie in front of the, the meal that you're having or stuff <laughs> like that, right? Put all that, that nonsense aside. Um, there's still this worry that by engaging in what I'm doing right now, I'm missing out on, on something else. And there are some philosophical approaches that would, I mean, even just stuff that doesn't have to get particular, phil, particularly philosophical and just says, hey, live in the moment you're in, eat the food in front of you right now, or be with the person that you're, you're you know, across the table from, um, that would be helpful. But when we get to substantive philosophical approaches, I think there's, there's more room for curbing FOMO or the grass is greener thing or um, the kind of paralysis that can happen in trying to make decisions for so many people. Yeah. If the whole idea of having some rules that you're trying to, that, that are uh, set out for you um, to try to live your life by uh, helps one make decisions better and be more content with the decisions that they've made. Yeah. I think there's also a critical aspect to um, philosophy. You know, when we look at our own society, it is probably tougher for us with respect to the paradox of choice than it was people 20 years ago, in part because of the proliferation of um, ways that, you know, mobile technology and the internet and um, everything being mediated through through computers uh, allows us to do so much more and have so many choice, so many more choices in, in front of us, right? Um, so you know, philosophy can can sort of clue us in, and it's not the only discipline that can do that. To to the how how vulnerable we've we've made ourselves in in the culture that we're we're in, and then we can identify. Oh, maybe maybe this is actually not a situation I need to be in where I need to choose between twenty different things. Maybe this would be a better thing for me to just pick pick one particular thing and and uh stick with it or narrow de- maybe deliberately narrow my range of choices maybe that's the thing to do in some cases so you know one of the the studies the case studies that was done by uh in regards to the, like this paradox of choice is r- grocery stores like trader joe's or aldi which has an, a significantly reduced amount of options for any particular thing it was like oh there's salsa, but there's only like four options instead of like a hundred. And they're um, all the same brand, right? Generally, yeah, yeah, pretty much. You know, some things might have a, a brand name here or there, but like for the most part, it's like it's the store brand. You know, here's the one you got. Yeah, pick it or not. Um, and, and people, uh, you know, flock to these stores for you know this and other reasons, but uh, there, there's definitely. Some studies that said that there are there are benefits from having a reduced choice in that. 
Yeah, you know, the prototypical product with perhaps too many choices is spaghetti sauce. Mm. You know, you've got a lot of different brands, right? And, and some of them, you know, are oriented towards different kinds of consumers. Um, like, you know, Paul Newman gives a certain amount to charity, right? So if you like charity, okay, then that, that fits in there. And there could be like some local brands that you're like, you know, you have a, an attachment to because you want to support local uh, spaghetti sauces. I don't know of any for Wisconsin, but you know, there, there must be something somewhere. Um, right. But so many of them, like the Paul Newman or Classico or, or whatever, it's going to have like anywhere from like six to 20 different sauces that you can have. And maybe the, maybe the way to approach that is you say, okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to look at all these sauces. Yeah. I'm just going to think about um, the brand that I want and I'll, I'll only choose within that range. Or I'll say, I only want sauces that have mushrooms and black olives and, mm-hmm. and, and I'm not going to consider anything else. Maybe that's the, the way to handle some of that over variety. Right? Yeah. I mean, here, actually, we should think about this in sort of practical problems. Um, another big one that a lot of people have wasted a ton of time on is with Netflix or Hulu or any of these streaming services. They offer you all these different options, and some people will take a, a, an extraordinary amount of time, so much that they don't get to watch anything, deciding what they're going to watch. Right. Is there is there a, is there a way to get yourself out of that? whatever we want to call it, that trough or bucket where you've got all these different things in front of yourself. There's a way to climb out of that so that you can produce a good situation for yourself. I don't know. Maybe you have got one director that you like and you're just like, oh, I'm just going to watch everything that he makes. But that's just a heuristic, you know. Yeah. In a way, it's it's reducing your autonomy to say, okay, I'm going to make a rule and stick with that, right? Mm-hmm. But it's the rational thing to do in many cases. Right. Okay. Bringing it back to philosophy, like uh, Aristotle has this like this golden mean, and like between mm-hmm. like being a, a coward and and going and, and fighting a thousand people all by yourself. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's foolish. You know. And it's, it, you might think it's like courageous, but it's like cur- courage. Foolhardy. Cra- they call it, yeah. yeah. Um. And so maybe we take this idea of the golden mean and also bring it to here. It's like okay. Have a heuristic. You work with it until it doesn't feel right anymore, and then maybe pick a new heuristic or a, a new way to constrain yourself. Okay. Yeah, I've I've seen satisficers talked about as similar to Aristotelian moderation. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder too if we couldn't say that it's also similar to temperance or self control. Mm-hmm. You know, um, deliberately restricting yourself. Instead of saying, I'm going to have it all, uh, and not having it all, of course, but having it all sort of in possibility, you say, um, I know that I'm liable to fall into wa- you know, not even watching anything, but just scrolling through different movie titles for um, half the length of a movie. So I'm, I'm going to deliberately make a decision to, to not do that, you know. Uh, maybe I'll just get like a, a, a list and then go down that list of, of, of movies. You wanted to talk about uh, the pragmatist view of this. Oh, yeah. So there are a lot of uh, decisions. This is something that William James says in The, the Will to Believe. Uh, but a lot of philosophers have, have talked about this before James and, and many after. There's a lot of decisions where we we can't really know what we're getting ourselves into unless we jump into it. And he gives examples of like taking a job or um, getting involved with a romantic partner. If he says he's got a great uh, little vignette in there where this person is skeptical about whether the other person truly loves them or not. And he says, you know, if you don't like uh, take some of this on faith and then like make some moves, you're never actually going to find out whether they do like you or not. Um, you, you have to go on a date. You have to you have to do something with them, right? Uh, if you're if you're going to wait for like complete confirmation before you you leap, well, you'll never you'll, you're never going to leap. And I think there's a lot of things like that. And I think that part of what James is saying there is we shouldn't be stupid or foolhardy or you know. 
um, go off as they say half cocked, but we should give ourselves permission to get into things and realize that they they're they're you know so much of life is really an experiment and some of it's going to go wrong. Um, and that's not, you know, provided we didn't do any stupid uh, decision making at the start, provided we were, you know, being fairly rational, given the best information we had, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not, it's not something we have to feel regret about. Um, I mean, unless we, we say things like, you know, I wonder what it would be like to, to kill and cook a human being. Okay, now James would say, don't do that, right? You know, um, but when it comes to these other things, uh, ways of resolving the paradox of choice, maybe we should be more pragmatic and experimental about it and not place, um, you know, not place a heavy burden on ourselves. And then when we, when we start doing negative self-talk, like saying, oh, we're so stupid to make this choice, you know, I should have done that thing over there. Maybe we have to talk back to that, that negative self-talk and say, I made the best decision at the time, that I, given the information I had. You know? This reminds me of the idea of the map is not the terrain. Okay. That, uh, you know, we looking at options before we take it, actually experience them fully. We're, yeah, we're yeah. seeing a, a a grainy version of the actual reality of the situation, and uh, you know, we we have to realize that you know, we can make all these decisions based off these outside looking in experiences. Um, but until we're actually inside, there's uh, a whole gambit of, of different experiences that we may or may not like. And there's only one way to actually find out. Yeah. And, and I think that there's so many areas where that is the norm. Um, one of the ones I wanted to talk about was choosing a college to go to. I ask my students quite often in classes, well, why did you pick this college to go to? And they'll give me some reasons. And, I, and then I'll say, well, how did you know that that was actually going to be the case? And they said, well, uh, you know, I saw it in the college brochure. And I said, well, they all, you know, all these college brochures basically look the same. They all say that this is a wonderful academic environment. They have, you know, happy, shiny people on the front, you know, <laughs> on a bright day sitting in the quad. They, they're all basically cut from the same cloth, right? And they'll, they'll have buzzwords in there like quality education and small class sizes or whatever it's going to be. Study with world-renowned scholars. You have no idea that you're going to get any of that stuff when you go to any particular college. Because it could be that the world-renowned researchers, they're on sabbatical that year, you know. Mm -hmm. Or it could be like now where uh, whatever place you picked, uh, they're dealing with COVID. Yeah. Um, so you, have, you really have almost no idea what you're getting into. And I think it's easy to... It's easy to wind up in that that like fear of missing out or thinking the grass is greener somewhere else if we're not careful. So we, we have to be prudent about about these sorts of things. And we have to say, well, you know, you can try to acquire information like the best way to find out about colleges is not to talk to the tour guide. It's to like go off of the tour and like wander in and ask people what they think of the place. <laughs> <laughs> then, right. then eventually the tour guide will corral you and bring you back and start, you know, yammering at you about how great this this place is or this place is. Um, but, you know, even then you can't get you can't get full information. I think we can say the same thing about jobs. You, you, you take a job in a company, you know, you've done a, a couple interviews with them. Maybe you've done your due diligence, but you, you don't really know what that company's uh, like deep down inside. You know, That's, we very infrequently get the ability to control uh, variables in a, uh, you know, a scientific manner in order to really come down to the heart of the issue and yeah. to compare two or more choices and say like this definitively is this way or the other and uh, and especially for the, it's, the worse it is the larger the decision like I yeah. can try out a thousand different on uh, tomato sauces and potentially find one that I have definitively decided that I will like and that's the one I'm going to eat for the rest of my life. Um, but you can't try out a thousand different colleges. There's, there's just not yeah, the that's time right, that's nor right, the yeah. ability. Yeah. yeah. And um, shout out to Alfred uh, Korizski for uh, the map territory relationship. Oh, right, right. Yeah, the general semantics people. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. This is totally off topic, but there is actually a science fiction author 
who has an Institute for General Semantics in his stories. It's A. Van Vogt, and he has this world of null A. He was really impressed by, by that movement, and he built that philosophy into his, uh, his novels. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, it's, it's way off in the future. The, the Institute is like developed and all that. I think it actually gets nuked at one point, if I remember <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So we, we did want to talk about, as we usually do, some sort of uh, practice that you can apply in your yeah. everyday life. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't get to that. So do you want to lead us through that? Sure. And so we've been kind of beating around this bush this entire hour. So. The, the, the practice is investigate what is truly valuable and then apply. So uh, one of the basic questions of philosophy is what do we or should we value? Is there a hierarchy of values or a delineation between these things that have value and those things that do not? And you know, depending on the school of thought, there are different answers to this question. But the, the biggest thing is to investigate some of them, choose one, apply that choice, and and be pragmatic as we're talking about like the live like a stoic beat. You know? Just try out the stoic practices. Live like it. Record your like feelings about how you enjoy that. Maybe that's for you. Maybe it's not. Maybe the Epicureans are better to fit you and your proclivities. You know, I'm going to bring up William James uh, again as well here. He thought that a lot of philosophy was a matter of uh, temperament. Mm. That you know, he, he was what we call a pluralist. He didn't think that there was just one philosophical path that was completely right. <clears throat> and he thought that people were attracted to and found different philosophies useful for themselves because of, yeah, we could call it whatever, part of their personality, their temperament. Um, but the idea was that not, not everything is for every single person. Um, some some approaches are going to be more productive for for some people, and, and and I don't think we should feel bad about that. I think we should we should give ourselves again permission to like experiment and see what works for us, and then apply it. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the human condition. Ho hopefully, you've got the wherewithal to to try things and, and try to find that yeah you know, that niche that the niche that like fits you as well as possible. Yeah, and it can be kind of like a feedback thing, right? How do you know that something is really going to work for you? It doesn't just like immediately hit you in the face and say, boom, this works perfectly across the board. You, you got to work at it a bit and practice. And then it, it like reveals something to you. And then you're like, oh, now I get it. And then you do some more stuff and then it, it rewards you some more, you know, or maybe challenges you or, or whatever, you know. And, and so it's a continual dialectical process. And it seems like a lot of people kind of go through this in their teenage years and they try out a whole bunch of different persona or things that they think they're going right. to like. And then and we kind of solidify and say, yeah, I, I did enough investigation. I'm good with what I've got. And, <laughs> and I would say you should you know, maybe not do it as much as a teenager, but like you need to uh, open yourself up to the, at least the opportunity. That's a great, that's a, yeah, I like that. That's, that's a great way to think about it. Sort of a moderate approach, right? You don't have to, uh, you know, suddenly open up every single possibility. Uh, that would be opening up Pandora's box, quite literally, right. uh, the <laughs> box of evils. <laughs> uh, but you, but you, yeah, you should be open to, to doing more. And, and so this leads us to our, our ending quote. Do you want to take us out on, on this one? Okay, from Voltaire. In his writings, a wise Italian says, the best is the enemy of the good.